Hey, everyone, and welcome to this episode of This is Leadership, your intersection between growth and leadership. And today, folks, I've got quite a treat for you. It's part three of the series uh, where we're talking about the book Disrupt the Status Quo. And I've already interviewed two of the authors, and now I'm at the third. And so, and I'm really excited because, anyways, we'll just get into it. I've got a bunch of questions for, for my guest today. And None other than Brian Aspinall. So Brian is a teacher, he is a learner, he is a thinker, an author, and a problem solver, but he's also a question asker. Now, I read that off, off your website, Brian, and I'm not going to say any more because I want you to tell us a little bit like, you know, uh, what's going on with you. I know you got the YouTube channel, you got the books going, but... You know, I, I just think you're you're a great guy. I love what you put out on social media, not only uh, you know in education, but also you know all your videos with with your tiny home and and all the construction inside. I think it's just fantastic. So, listen, welcome Brian to the uh, podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we're we're a bit of an open book, I guess. I like you know, <laughs> all kidding aside, I've never built a house before, so. Practice I can't. what you preach. Like we're using YouTube as a portfolio of learning just shows the highs and lows and the ups and downs of everything that we've encountered. You know, maybe it'll help somebody else down the road. Uh, absolutely. And thanks to YouTube, I was able to fix my 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 dryer once in my life. <laughs> so I saved about probably about 250 bucks and just did it on my own. And the part cost, I think it was maybe 15 bucks. So Winning. yeah, yeah, that's good. It's good. So listen, Brian, uh, before we get into it, of course, we're going to be talking about this book right here. So for those of you on YouTube, Disrupt the Ooh. Status Quo, it is still hot on Amazon. It's doing fantastic. So we are doing the series on, uh, you know, the content content of this book. So we're going to be talking about this, Brian. But before we get into it, um, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about you. You know, sure. like, uh, like, like, tell us, you know, like uh, where you're at. And I know you were a teacher uh, in a K-12 system, but now you're not. You're at the university level. So I'll let you just tell us a little bit for the people that are listening a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I was a self-taught coder in the 90s. I was learning how to program websites in high school. And my principal actually approached me and asked me if I'd make the very first ever, you know, high school yeah. website. Yeah. In, uh, in the late 90s. And they paid me. It was, so I graduated high school with a portfolio because I, I took it from the high school to the pizza shop, to the hardware store, to the flower shop, awesome. all over town. Yeah. And uh, I was 17. It, it kind of funny to think I was 17 working remotely from home in the late 90s. Kind of sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I always wanted to be a teacher. And then the tech world fell into my lap around grade 11. Um and I ended up going to teacher's college, but I did get my undergrad degree in computer science. And right around the Y2K era, for those of you that are my age, remember the Y2K era, yeah. it was one of those, do you want to you want to head to Toronto and chase the dot-com dream? Or do you want to stay and live near the beautiful shores of Lake Erie mm -hmm. um, and become an educator? I come from a line of teachers. Yeah. I never expected to merge those two worlds and sort of find my niche, uh, if you will. But when I reflect back to my first early years teaching, you know, we teach to our strengths and computer yeah. science is my strength. So yeah. I've been coding in classrooms for 15 years. And admittedly, I grabbed my surfboard and jumped on the hour of code wave and, and wrote it. And I'm still riding it. Let's be real. Let's mm. not beat around the bush. That is exactly what I've done and exactly what I continue to do. Mm. I know what uh, I know what it's done for me. I know what it's done for students in my classroom both, uh, you know, identified with learning disabilities with an IEP and those yeah. identified with a uh, identified gifted or even core enrichment in my classroom. It, mm -hmm. It's sort of done both sides of the spectrum. After uh, 13 years in uh, the K-8 space, predominantly grades 7 and 8, I was literally poached by Western University. And they said, we have a brand new master's program, brand new. You'll be the second cohort. There's a course on computational thinking. We don't have anybody yeah. qualified to teach it. Yeah. Why don't you come here uh, and do it? And it was an online course. So I went back to grad school and that was it. After I won the prime minister's award, I took a leave of absence and did some consulting work for Microsoft Canada. And the rest, the rest is history. I took a two year leave from my district and never went back. If you had asked me, you know, five years ago, if I'd ever give up my classroom, I would have laughed at you. Yeah. And uh, no regrets. I mean, I've, I've been able to travel the world as far as Budapest, you know, doing, mm -hmm. doing my consulting work. So I'm really very fortunate, very grateful and very happy to still be in the system. I teach now at Queen's University and the University of Windsor. You know, and that just goes to show, you know, when we take risks, you know, it, it's the unknown, it's scary, but no risk, no gain, right? And we'll never know where it's going to take us. And I've had a, sim right. 
a, a similar story, you know, in my path, I started in education in 97. I was a chemistry teacher and 2006, I'm a principal since 2006. Uh, and, and, you know, I was able to, to take risks and I was able to, 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 be on detachment as well, go to the ministry for four years, did a lot of leadership coaching throughout the province with the Francophone, uh, Francophone school boards here in Ontario, uh, with, with the school principals and, and, and that is really the opportunity that I was able to, to jump on, but that's the opportunity that pushed me to realize the importance of leadership development, uh, the importance of, you know, providing that kind of training to our principals because they just didn't have it. I didn't have it, you know. And, and it was, it was a need. And then from there, it pushed me to create, you know, inspire leadership coaching, went into the French, the French podcast for the last four years. And now look at us, we're talking there and go. I've got the English. It's awesome. I, you know, I got the English podcast going and I'm meeting a whole bunch of great people, but listen, Brian, you know, you go, you, you speak all over, you know, nationally and internationally. And one of the things that caught my eye when you were posting and, and I think it was at that moment where I started following you were, and, and you're going to laugh, but I want to talk about the random airport selfie airdrops because, <laughs> <laughs> because what, when I seen you do that, I'm like, I don't know how many times I had thought of actually doing something like that, but you did it. So I, I, I thought that was awesome. Did you want to talk a little bit about, about that just to Holy. let the people know what it was? <laughs> These are, those are pre COVID days sitting in little yeah. Billy, sitting in little Billy Bishop airport with a steam whistle. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was yeah. listening. Steam whistles, a brewery here in Toronto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, it became a it became a game of probability and a way to entertain myself. So take really awkward selfie photos and see who's willing to accept them. The funny part is the people on the other end that actually click accept yeah. and then look around the room. <laughs> I think I'm fooling everybody, but I'm snickering in the corner with my beer like they don't know oh it's me. I'm wearing the same hoodie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I did that for uh, I did that for a number of years. That was oh good yeah, <laughs> I thought it was it was it was great. I loved it anyways. I was very entertained and. But, you know, that's just one of the things that I enjoyed, you know, from what you're posting, of course, your your journey, you know, and through the books and through Codebreaker, you know, where, where it started and then through, you know, your teachings, uh, you know, what you're doing at the university level, I think it's fantastic. But not to mention as well, your, you know, just recently is is your exercise routine, right? Because I'm, I'm big on that as well. I'm in the gym at 530 every morning. It he'll feed the body, feed the mind, right? So, you know, I really appreciate, you know, when whenever you post and you say you got to keep grinding, you got to keep going, you know, because it is important, right, to keep that that body, you know, healthy so that the mind can stay healthy. Uh, yeah, a thousand percent. I've been doing the gym five days a week since uh, the world opened here in 2023. Yeah, yeah. So we're on nine months again. Um, uh, just just to try and balance airport life too, right? It gets oh, crazy yeah. when you're in hotels all the time and. You're at a conference and it's always, you know, dinners are free, but it's always the same thing. So yeah, just try to be mindful of that. But I, I agree with you. I actually start my day at the gym. I go to the gym for nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I make sure it fits my my work schedule now. Uh, I'm always working from my phone. I get a lot of work done at the gym with my social media and things of that nature. So it's a bit of a double dip. Um, but I, I do not schedule meetings between nine and 11 o'clock in the morning. That is my gym routine and don't bother me. That's I'll awesome. be online, but I've done the occasional zoom on the treadmill, but the people at the gym don't like when I get lost. <laughs> <down. laughs> no, that's funny. I, I, I'd like to see that too. A ran, random, uh, yeah. gym, gym zoom sessions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be funny as well. No, listen, Brian. So le I just wanted to let you know that I really appreciate everything that you put out there and, uh, it's very inspirational. So, and I know you're inspiring a whole whack of people. So, uh, we really appreciate, keep it up and, uh, you know, we need to support each other that way. We need to push each other to be better, to, to disrupt. And we're going to talk, we're going to get into the book, you know, to disrupt the, the, the status quo and to better ourselves. So really appreciate it. And listen, let's get right into the book. Sure. Uh, I finished it. I really enjoyed it. So I, I'm really looking forward to this, this conversation, but also the conversation was going to be part five of the series. And when we're going to be able to get everybody together and ask you a few questions, uh, you know, additional questions in regards to the book. So, so let's get right into it, Brian. Um, so what I did, I read the book and I'm just, I just pulled a few, a few things from your sections that really, uh, that really spoke to me, you know, because I am a, a school principal myself. I'm a district principal now for the last two years, but uh, you know, I've been in the game for a long time. So a lot of stuff hit home with me. And one of the first ones was in the intro. And, um, and this one resonated because I'm still talking about this, uh, you know, when, when leading my, my uh, district team and when uh, coaching school principals and, and their teams and their schools. And he talked about, you know, how it's important to celebrate the process as well as the final product. And 
I'm, I, I recently I've, 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 uh, I've, I dove into uh, s- some work in regards to uh, collective leader efficacy. And, and we talk about that, how, you know, when we talk about PLCs, how it's become a word that, you know, teachers don't like anymore, and it's become cliche, right? And often, uh, what research is showing is that often it's because we're too focused on the end game on that product, you know, in school, we don't do that. eh? (laughs) You know, it's, it's often and you talked about it in your book. So it's often about that final product, but the process is really where it's at. So did you want to talk to us a little about that? You know, the importance of that process? Well, I mean, at the very beginning of life, we learn to walk by falling down or we learn to walk by not trying or by you know trying to avoid falling down. I've never understood our assessment and evaluation practices. And I think I come from a biased perspective, having studied computer science. Yeah. For starters, my higher ed experience was much different than, you know, I'm using air quotes, a traditional higher ed experience in that mm. I didn't have exams. And if I did, they were open book. I never had to memorize Java. I was told, here's the manuscript for Java. Now go solve the problem. Yeah. And it's no different than a mechanic opening a manual to figure out where the starter is on a Ford Explorer because they don't know every under the hood exactly the same. They don't know. Yeah. So the idea of memorization as a means for a grade didn't never really made any sense to me. And when Mm. I got into teaching math, I, I couldn't understand why I the expectation was to give quantities of work and then score it based on a quantity of correct answers. As a former mm-hmm. phys ed teacher, I never put all my kids on the foul line and graded them based on how many shots they made out of 10 because every one of them is going to fail. Yeah. So why, why was I, why was I doing that in math? You know, we're teaching the procedure of how to find the area of a circle, but not understanding conceptually what it means to find the area of a circle and why finding the area of a circle is incredibly important. Now, speaking from the computer science lens, when kids learn to code, it never works the first time through. So that forces us to redefine what it actually means to fail at school Mm. because debugging and and creating a program that does something properly is going to require a plethora of mistakes. And those shouldn't be faulted. Those those need to be those need to be celebrated. I don't think kids hate learning. I think kids hate the intimidation of time testing environments and the embarrassment of being labeled wrong. I feel strongly when kids cheat on assignments and tests, it's because the systems taught them that grades outweigh the importance of knowing things. And sure, people will push back and say kids cheat because they're busy and that. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a whole nother conversation about yeah. equity and, and giving work outside of school and, you know, uh, all of those pieces. Um, but in general, the process is is almost more important than than that final product in so many ways, because in a world that that changes overnight, that final product might require a remix. It might require a tweak. It might require some variable change. Like we're always moving and evolving and knowing how we got to that point relative to that point in time is very important. And and I couldn't agree more, you know, because, and I was thinking the same thing, you know, that end product isn't always going to look the same, right? So you're going to have to, and you're going to have to come back and figure out, well, what is it in the process that I need to change? And if you didn't even concentrate on that, or you just, you know, what's my final mark? And then you forget about the rest. Well, what are you going to do whenever it comes back up in life? Yeah. And then it doesn't look the same. Absolutely. My, my, my former elementary school I taught at, we, we went gradeless for about three or four years. Okay. Before it kind of fell apart, I left. The French teacher got a consulting role. The principal became a superintendent, and the school sort of unraveled uh, back to the way it was. Um, but what we noticed is the the language of our kids moved away from what did I get to what can I try or can I try this? And that changed everything because the what did I get uh, mindset creates a lot of fear. There's too much risk in not getting the grade. Why in the heck am I going to take a risk at school when grades are everything? But we keep pushing the narrative of taking risks and embracing failure but we all collectively work in a system in which failure is punished. We got kids repeating courses at high yeah. school or staying in at recess. It's, it's, it's the definition of the failure that we, we have to tweak. Failure can't be this four out of 10 narrative. It can be crap. That didn't work. What are we going to yeah. fix to get it to work? You know, yeah. Yeah. how are we going to move forward? So, yeah, because if we don't, you know, what's going to happen, you know, when, when you become adults or kids, right, they're going to be, tra- their minds going to be trained like that. And whenever, you know, the going gets tough and, and they don't succeed, well, then it's the end of the world, right? Yeah. It's funny you say that. When when we were doing the grade list, we had three elementary schools feed okay. to the same high school. And we thought, how is this going to look in a, yeah. over long term? Well, fast forward five years, when the grade 12s from the high school were coming to do the recruiting, they were all our former students. 
I said to the guidance counselor, did you set this up? Did you bring our former students on purpose? And she said, I had no idea where these kids came from. They're in grade 12. The fact that they come from your school just tells us that you continue to send us the leaders, the problem solvers, the yeah. innovative thinkers. Yeah. They said that the biggest difference they noticed in grade nine was when an iPad was dead or an app wouldn't load, kids from another school would just throw it aside and sit there for 75 minutes and say, well, you didn't tell me what to do because yeah. they're used to the spoon fed generation. Yeah. Our kids would not only pick up the iPad, try and plug it in. They'd try and code them an app at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you know what? And I don't think there's enough of that that's going on in our schools. And like I said, I've been a principal since 2006 and it wasn't really a priority, you know, until, until the last, I'd say the last 10 years where I realized it and I, I realized how important it was to develop those competencies, right, within our kids to be able to problem solve and to know what to do and to be able to search for maybe a different source of, uh, of answer or a different way of doing it because yeah. – you know, the kids would come back or I talked to parents, you know, when the kids, when their kids had moved on to college university and, and, you know, as much as I heard success stories, I would hear stories where they didn't succeed. And it was because they didn't know how to organize themselves. They didn't know how to manage their time. They didn't know how to ask for help. It's, you know? it's, it's funny you say that I think we're very like-minded in that regard. When parents used to ask me for extra math homework, cause they wanted their kids to improve their grades. Yeah. I would suggest it's not the math that's the issue. It's the lack of organization. Go look in that desk. That's what we, we need to work on. We need to work on, and because we're both in Ontario, we need to work on those learning skills. Everything yeah. else will fall into place. If, here in Ontario, if you look at the front page of a report card, you don't have to open it to know what the grades are. If it's E's yeah. and G's, you're good. That's an A student, you know? Yeah. Um, so if we focus on initiative, maybe the rest will fall into place. Exactly. Exactly. Now, um, another part uh, of, of a section that you wrote in the book, it really spoke to me because it's actually a line that I use often, right? And the line is, you know, that it, every person in my school knows something that I don't. So yeah, I talked about that. And it was in a section where you talked about in your classroom, you, you qualified it as being flat. Yeah. So I thought, you know, can you talk to us about that? Because I thought that was a really interesting perspective. Yeah, trying to not only flatten my classroom, but with the help of a great leader or administrator, rather, I shouldn't say leader, we're all leaders in our own right. Yeah, yeah. Um, just trying to remove the hierarchy because the hierarchy it falls under a compliant model. And if we set expectations that our kids are going to, you know, behave based on societal expectations, we don't need to put up rules about chewing gum and asking to, to go to the back, like I, it, that's wearing your that's, hat or. It, it doesn't make sense to me that our kid, we teach our kindergarten students to regulate, like, listen to your body. Oh, you're hungry. You should get a snack. You need to pee, go to the bathroom. But then in grade one, they have to sit quietly and let That's the bell like a tell whole them. different world. <laughs> they go from five to six and all of a sudden the bell tells them when they can eat and all of those yeah. other things. Um, yeah. One of the, <laughs> in my first five years teaching, uh, one of the best educators in the building was the custodian. Mm. Let me say that again. One of the best educators in the building was the custodian. And that's when I really, 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 really started to begin that just because I have the degree doesn't mean, you know, I know anything more than he does. We, Absolutely. my classroom was across the hall from his, but he came in all the time to talk about where math and STEM fit in his world of making sure that's doing great. just simple bait, uh, building, you know, maintenance. That's really where that quote comes from is, you know, he was so good. He he was he came on our overnight grade eight field trips. Like the, really? kids, the kids loved this guy uh, quite often more than some of their own teachers. To be honest, yeah. with you. He, <laughs> here's the difference: he would go and engage them in fun math play, but he didn't have to grade them. So there's yeah. the difference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like it was like when the grandparents come over, right? Then they get yes. the kids all excited, then they leave. So they leave. I, That's right. <laughs> I've known I've known many custodians as well that that it was the same thing. You know, kids would just gravitate to them, right? Not only because yeah. they had that 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 skill to be able to connect with the kids but you know to be able to actually draw some 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 links between you know even the work he's doing in math or or language or or whatever else it could be and then all of a sudden you know in my schools i would have in my elementary schools especially i would have like this huge list of names of kids that wanted to stay at lunch and stuff just to help them out to help them clean help them you know so that he can have more time so i thought i thought that was great but it just goes to show you right when you flatten yeah. When we're thinking about flattening out the classroom, let's think about flattening out the whole thing, the whole school, right? Like everybody, like you said, I'm a firm believer that everybody can be a leader as well in their own way. And it's just, it's just a matter of us to going to find that, you know, to find that within somebody and to bring it out, right? Because that's when we never know what we're going to get. Yeah, you can, and everything you just said speaks to 
the culture and, and community of the building. You know, I've worked in other Absolutely. schools too where the custodian would get mad at the science teacher for doing an experiment, right? Because it, it meant there'd be a mess. Yeah. So you, you, you kind of see both. Um, but I also recognized in that school where the custodian would be unhappy about the mess, there were hierarchies. And that was a key difference that I noticed. There was an administrator at the top and a custodian at the bottom and the rest yeah. of us kind of in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And and we, I think we could all agree, well, you and I, anyways, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be in schools. And for the people that are listening, you know, I hope that you can, you know, think about, you know, how, how what's the culture in your building? How is it? Is there hierarchies like that? You know, are there different levels and how can you go about to, to eliminating that? You know, how can you go about uh, going to see your, your, your custodian, for example, or even your principal and, and seeing how you can integrate them into your classroom and get, get yeah. them to connect with the kids as well, because everybody has got something to contribute. And it comes back to what you, to, to what you said, right. That every person in my school knows something that I don't. And that applies for the kids too. In, in the last, uh, in the better part of the last decade, I've been to hundreds of schools all over North yeah. America. And you can tell the second you step foot in the front building, what the culture is like, the second you walk in that door, you can I tell. imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good and bad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, Brian, I thought it was great the way you said it is, and we talk about, you know, it's not about the curriculum, right? We got to do the connections first and curriculum is there to guide you, but it shouldn't be the, you know, the, the, the know all and end all. So in the book, you mentioned how, you know, it was a key turning point for you when your thinking shifted from delivering cur curriculum to discovering curriculum. I think that's a, that's a bit that's going to be really important for the people that are listening to this podcast episode to be able to, to hear from you exactly what you meant by that. And that hopefully the people that are listening are going to share, you know, within, you know, with their colleagues and their schools as well. So talk to us about, you know, discovering curriculum versus delivering and that Im the impact that it had on you. Yeah, one of the, a couple of projects in my mind stick out. One really impactful project, I think it's in this book, I've written about it many, many times, is the lawnmower story. Yeah. Uh, I was teaching grade eight at the time and we were doing genius hour, passion yeah. projects, the buzzword of the last uh, decade. Yeah. Um, but that's when it really, 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 really dawned on me. I knew I knew when I was trying to get it, so we're going to go back 15, 20 years when it was really hard to get a teaching job in the province of Ontario. Yeah, because yeah. It was I remember, one oh, yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> and I remember in those days playing buzzword bingo. That meant I had to memorize all the curriculum documents. I had to know every buzzword so that I could drop it during an interview. Because at the time, the person interviewing you, typically an administrator, was checking a box to make sure you said or did whatever they were looking for with that terminology. Mm. Yeah. So I learned very on the importance of understanding the curriculum, um, but I didn't quite get the concept of recognizing the curriculum. I always thought I was a stand and deliver. I worked for FedEx. Yeah. Yeah. Here I am today. I'm going to provide you um, with packets of information. We're going to dissect them together, get out your pencils, yada, 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 yada. And that didn't that model didn't work for me being on, you know, computer science and, and programming all through university. I, I but I didn't, I didn't know any better, right? That's the school system that I went to in K to 12. That's the way all my colleagues were kind of teaching. This is again, just past Y2K. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when, when I remember getting calls from parents uh, to the school saying, we don't want our kids in Mr. A's class, I really took wow. it to heart. But when yeah. I started to dissect it, the issue was all you do is play. And when I heard that, I was very, 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 very offended. Mm -hmm. Today, it's a, today I hold that in really, really, really high regard. Uh, but at the time, what I heard was he's an easy teacher. They don't do work in that classroom. Yeah. Uh, and what, as we call, you know, what we call intermediate teachers here in Ontario, I was taught early on that they run a tight ship. So that meant oh, quiet, yes. quiet rows. If you're uh, this grade seven, grade eight teacher, and you're giving hours of homework every night. That model didn't work for me. So when I stumbled upon Genius Hour, probably around 2008, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. whenever it hit the social media feed, I started to really look at that. And I started to dissect, particularly in grade eight, because here I am uh, at Christmas, month four of grade eight, the 10th year of elementary school for our kids in, in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And now there's, they're picking courses for high school, right? They're yep, in their yep. fourth month. And they're, they're ready to pick courses at Christmas. And all of a sudden I'm like, these, I got this group of kids over here that just never do the worksheets I give them, not because they don't want to, but because they'll do like three of the questions and be like, yeah, I get it. I'm not doing the yeah, other. And that's it. Yeah. That's it. 
did I get these three right? Yeah, you did. Then I don't need to do five yeah. more. I'm moving yeah. on. So the lawnmower project, I had a group of boys that came from a family of mechanics. I think uncle owned the shop or something of that nature. And they were going to take shop at grade nine. So why can't we explore those things in grade eight? And they were like, all we want to do is take apart a motor and put it back together. And I'm like, that's what you'll do in grade nine. I did that in grade nine. Everyone's going to do that in grade nine. Yeah. Why can't you start now, you know, in grade yeah. eight? I said, just go okay with the principle that we're actually bringing in a gas powered machine here. That's the only thing because it's <laughs> elementary school still. Yeah. He, he says, whatever, go dump the gas and oil in the back field. We're good. <laughs> um, but as I'm watching these kids dissect this, this small engine and take it apart. And I heard the one kid say it's a 24 inch deck. And I went, Oh, cause we do circles in grade eight. And Absolutely. all of a sudden that was my light bulb moment. I said, that kid just talked about the circumference of that deck. Yeah. Now I'm going to go ask him how long that blade is and see if there's a correlation to pi. Those kids, I swear on my life, will never, ever, ever forget that. And they, so they understood the circumference of a circle. They understood what pi meant in relation to the distance around is almost 3.14 times greater than the distance across. Granted, the lawnmower blade doesn't go to the end, but yeah, in just context, a little shorter. it's incredibly meaningful for these kids to see that it's close to 3.14. And then all of a sudden the oil cap says 5W on it instead of 10W. And I'm like, oh my God, we do viscosity in grade eight science. Right. Now we're doing particle theory. Like, hello. Those kids will never forget that you put a thicker oil in an engine during the winter because it's cold. They will mm. never forget that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the, the issue is now, how do you evaluate this experience, right? How do you quantify numerically now? Yeah. And it, it's a twofold problem in Ontario. Well, not moving forward when we're getting rid of streaming but at the time these kids are heading to the applied stream at the time and there's nothing wrong with the applied stream mm -hmm. but the second now i'm like oh they got an a in math all these red flags go up can they go into <laughs> academic no and they shouldn't but i graded them based on what they, they were able to do in this exactly. experience it wasn't standardized so that was a big eye opener for me because it wasn't just it was math play, which is shameless plug, one of our upcoming books. But it was um, it was authentic in context. It wasn't like I gave them ten worksheets and said, "Go find, go find the radius of the four hundred meter track outside." Boring, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a lot of others building arcade machines and exploring surface area awesome. of, of painting them and. That to me was just such an eye opener, but it, it also came with big problems. I could write the best report card comments, but articulating the experience numerically was next to impossible. Luckily for us in Ontario, we can fall back to growing success, yeah. use our professional judgment, observation, yeah. conversation. But in intermediate, we still give an actual number. Is it a That's 71? Right. Is it a 94? That's right. What is it? So yeah. th those are some barriers that we had to overcome, particularly because, well, we had some other problems too, like superintendents showing up and saying, you're not getting your kids ready for high school. Mm. Uh, and respectfully to my kudos to my administrator, he looked at his boss and said, respectfully, how are our high schools getting ready for our kids? Yeah. Yeah. It's such an eye opening statement. Yeah, said, we don't, we don't do we don't do business like that here. If they want them to sit quietly for 75 minutes and write notes, they're going to teach them that skill, not us. Yeah. Yeah. If you tell me our kids don't have the skill of writing tests, I'll make sure our grade eights practice writing a test before the end of the year. But it's not for a grade. It's to learn the skill of test taking and how to beat multiple choice. Yeah. Yeah. Really and, food for thought. It trickled so far that our, our grade nine and grade 10 teachers actually started going gradeless, too. Yeah, uh, as a result. Oh, I think that's that's just unbelievable. That, that you know, it just exposes it, right? And having you know, you 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 only know what you, you what you know, right? So as a teacher, you know, I prop I when I first started, I, I started teaching the same way probably that I was taught when I became a school principal. I was influenced by the principles that I had, so you know, I would probably do it, uh, you know, as uh, as they had done it. But I quickly realized, 
little bit like you that it wasn't working for me, right? And it and it's funny your story about the lawnmower. Okay, the lawnmower project. I just, I got to say this because way back in '97 is when I started teaching, which was the year of the the strike. There was a strike that year in '97. I had first started. Yeah, had to I borrow some money. High school, I remember. <laughs> I had to borrow some money from my parents to, to to pay my rent, and that was in 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 Whitby, Oshawa area, by the way. Anyways, to get back to it, so I was teaching grade seven and eight. I got I taught grade seven and eight for about four years. And uh, I remember the one project I, I had them do, and it was to build casino games for real, like casino games. And they had, and it was the best project I ever done in my whole career in classroom with uh, grade seven and eights. And I ran into the same problem. I'm like, my God, how am I going to grade this? How I because grade you know we had the parents come in uh, in the evening, and and there were games that you could play. They actually made them with cardboard and wood and stuff like that. And I would I would get them to calculate the probabilities of winning. Right? What are the probabilities of your game that, that you can win? So it was really interesting. But I feel you when you say you were asking yourself that question: How the heck am I going to evaluate, evaluate this? And back then, we didn't have growing success, success. Right? We didn't have that. So we're like, oh my god, I figured something out. It probably wasn't the best way to grade. But I remember that every you know, every, every group ended up doing very well because they were engaged. It spoke to them and, and, uh, they were just hundred percent, 150% involved. Right. And yeah. Like, yeah. If we let's pick on scratch, the coding environment that I live in, because yeah. the entire, the entire application requires a mastery of geometry just to do anything in it. So every kid in my class by the end of the year was getting straight A's in geometry. If you could build anything in scratch, you understood translating across a grid system, which is great in geometry. You yeah. understood reflex reflections, you understood translations through and through. I could say, what are the integer signs in quadrant three? And they simply put the cat there and say minus yeah. minus just by looking at the screen. So the 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 screen became the teacher, freeing up my time to conference with other kids that might needed, you know, exactly some support. Back to that lawnmower story very, very briefly, and kudos to my administrator for being selfish. Mm. His thought process was, you're going to engage those kids and keep them out of my office. Think <laughs> about it. Everybody went. And that's the truth. And I'm not, I'm not picking I on agree. kids because those kids are quite often the ones that are going to change the world. But they're out of their mind because they're bored. They're out of their mind because they, they're not engaged. They're not engaged. The kids that are playing school are going to play school. They, they know the game very well. So... And, and like, as an administrator, I'm not saying that, you know, the, the kid that's the, the kid that's sent to the office, you know, three times a day, uh, getting them more engaged might not completely change them a hundred percent. However, I know for a fact that the kids that I would receive very often, you know, after speaking with the teacher and, and going in to observe a little bit, I, it was, it would always come up. They just weren't engaged academically. It was boring to them. And it was generic, you know, it was a, it was a blanket, you know, these blanket activities, there was no yeah. uh, differentiation, uh, which I like to call, I'd rather call, you know, uh, pedagogical flexibility. There was yeah, like, no pedagogical flexibility and no wonder. Of book. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you know, so, you know, it might not, you might not solve all the problems, but I think it would have solved, you know, a good, at least 50% of it, you know, to get them more engaged and interested in actually going. Cause they did right off the bat, they didn't even want to go in the class anyway. So of course they're going to yeah. do whatever it takes to get booted out. Get Cause out. they don't want to be there. Right? Exactly. Prior, prior to pandemic, Prior to pandemic, when snow days were still a thing, we had ninety yeah. percent of our intermediate students staying home to ninety percent of our intermediate students coming to school. Yeah. And we're like, why? Why are you here? You know, it's a knowledge day. You know, everything's on Google Drive, and you're going to pick away at your work. And I kid you not, this one girl came in. Her dad drove her in in his eighteen wheeler, and she literally said FOMO. She literally said FOMO. <laughs> I can't not be here because it'll drive me crazy seeing what you're all doing at school on the snow yeah. day. Yeah. That was. That was it. The less we talked about grading and standardized testing, the better our grades and standardized test scores got. Oh my God. And what, what, a you know, what a, uh, uh, what a story to hear from, from, from a student, you know, it's powerful when it comes from them and they actually say things like that. That's when we realize, right? Like, holy smokes, you know, we're, we're on the right path here and this is what the, our kids need. So yeah, and, she was an identified student too, with an IEP, like the school's the last place she wanted to be. Exactly. So that brings me to, to, to the next topic. And I don't know if, if you'd be okay if I shared, if I just read a little paragraph from the book, sure. because it was, yeah. it was actually uh, one of the last sections and you had, you were talking about your uh, student led TEDx talk, your, your oh, events yeah. in your school. Yeah. And I got to share this with everybody that's listening, everybody that's watching on YouTube here. I'm going to share just this, this, this one account that one of the kids actually that, that, that you wrote in your book that one of the kids said during their Ted talk. Okay. And yep. that just, just get you to react and, t and tell us a little bit, you know, 
a little bit of background in, in terms of that student there. So the student said, up. oh, I know. It, <laughs> it was, when I read it, I was like, holy geez, it's, it's, it's extremely powerful, right? So here it is. So the student said in the TED Talk, you tell me what to draw in art class and grade my creativity based on how well it looks compared to someone else's. I just want to be creative and that cannot be standardized. Like goosebumps. goosebumps. It's oh. a reaction. Yeah. Tell us about that. We we all just kind of looked around the room like, yeah, like that's it to a T. There's so many systematic systemic problems here to, to dissect. Like why? Why are 24 kids in art class all drawing the same apple from a different perspective? And then why are we grading them comparatively? What is happening? The kid said, I'm not really good at art, but I really want to explore it. But you're kind of beating it out of me. Like, I don't want to do art at school anymore. I know. It's, <laughs> it's like, like, how come we didn't realize that before? It's, it's, it's like, oh my God, it's true. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not uh, making like, robots here in school, right? We want yeah, to make people that think. Does it say everybody has to draw an apple? Where does it yeah. say that? You know, yeah. it, it's like when I was teaching phys ed, I used to give bonus points to the kids that came to class prepared and sat down in their squad on time. Why yeah. was I, I doing remember that? Those I, days. I didn't do that in math. You come to class with a protractor set. Oh, you get two points. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Where's the, where's the document that says that that's okay? And how how can you use grades as a reward in one context and Anyway, yeah. that's a topic for another day. Yeah, that'll be for another, maybe another podcast. But yeah, so I, I just thought that was really powerful and eye-opening. So, you know, for the people that are listening, you know, just just think about, you know, what that young student said and think about your classroom. What are you doing? How are you teaching? How are you, uh, how are you uh, using that pedagogical flexibility, right? Like, are you asking everybody to do the same thing and then you're grading it on a model? Or are you asking to be creative and and to look for things that they enjoy, and you're still and you're still getting the learning done, and you're still able to grade it right? So I think just think there's different ways that we can go about it to engage the students. Well, I I, I remember when we were doing circles, so grade eight two D measurement, right? Circles. So I had the lawnmower group doing their thing with lawnmowers, but the group building the arcade, they had to know what a three eighths three eighths bit was so yeah. they could holes for arcade buttons like it didn't yeah. matter what we were doing we're looking at circles here <laughs> absolutely absolutely so listen brian it's, uh, it's been i can talk to you for hours it's uh, i'm so happy that that you're on the podcast and that we're able to meet for, you know for real well, for yeah. real, virtually for the first time so um coming back to the book right and here it is again for people on youtube get it get it get on amazon go buy the book disrupt the stages hey, quo uh, that book um between the four of us, yeah. I guess is, you know, 20, 30 years in the making collectively from one text message to live on Amazon was six weeks. Boom. So, yep. you know, those people that are listening, if you have a story to tell and you're passionate about something, put it out there, you know, just, just put it out there because three months ago, this wasn't even on our radar. And now I'm having this conversation with you and yeah. it's number three bestseller today on Amazon. Yeah. Canada. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So listen, Brian, you know, and I've asked this, uh, to, to, to each, uh, of, of the authors and I'll ask you the same question. So, and you know, in a few sentences, what does disrupt the status quo mean to you? Disrupt the status quo to yeah. me, uh, means that in a world that changes over overnight, the only strategy guaranteed to fail is not trying something new. Love it. There was a time in my teaching career where I could use a good project or lesson for two or three years. Now I wouldn't even bother repeating a task unless it really, really, really had an impact and was meaningful and authentic and engaging yeah. uh, to those students. I often reflect back on the old Nelson textbook questions about <laughs> lemonade stands. And, you know, <laughs> Nelson textbook tries to put a group of diverse students at the end of a driveway. There's typically three, probably two girls and a boy and says something like you're selling lemonade for 25 cents a cup. And if they sold four in an hour, how much will they sell in seven hours? Yeah. Or whatever, yeah. Whatever. yeah. And the issue I have with that today uh, is, number one, I don't know how many kids in my class have tried lemonade. I don't know how many kids in my class like lemonade. I don't know how many kids in my class have ever really sold anything at a yard sale. Yeah. And quite honest with you, some kids in my class don't have driveways, and many kids in my class have a hard time defining home. Mm. What I mean by that, uh, back to your question, is we live – and teach through our own experiences. And those, those come with very thick blinders and yeah. it's hard to remove the blinders. Cause we don't, we don't know what we don't know. 
And I think the only way to truly begin to understand is number one, every person in your building knows something you don't. So number two, start asking questions uh, and getting to know these kids. I think our job as educators is to know our curriculum incredibly well and to recognize it in the moment, but to provide opportunities of innovation for our students to be uh, young problem solvers and, and to create new things. You know, my former district still has an exam policy. So uh, yeah. granted, exams still go on at the secondary yeah. level and there are educators that hide behind said policy. Well, the policy was written 50 years ago. And if you yeah. don't think, you know, we all knew the world was changing, but if COVID has taught us anything, it's that the world changed on a dime and it's going to continue to do so. So we can't sit back under that narrative of because it's always been done that way. And so disrupt, be relentless, be bold, be brave, go out there and, and just, if you're trying to make, do this, you know, make decisions in the best interest of, of our young people in our classrooms, you'll never be wrong. Yeah. And you got a question, right? Because it comes back. I think you had mentioned, I wrote it down uh, in the perspective section of the book, good intentions, devastating impact, right? So if we just yep. keep doing it, we don't question it. Our intentions are good, but we don't know the damage that we're doing. That's right. That's right. I, um, I, having sort of fallen into the public speaking realm, yeah. I ask my peers to take photos of the crowd uh, and to make sure that I have a slide in the background. The reason is sometimes my intention uh, is all my message and my intention is only as good as the interpretation of the listener, not whatever right. it is I have to say. That's right. And a, a shameless plug from from Orlando on the weekend. Yeah. There's a photo of me 25 minutes into my keynote. There are 250 people in the room and every set of eyes is on me. There's no device. There's no computer. No nothing. And that's important. That's data for me. Yeah, that's yeah. that's data for me. But it, what it means is not only was I engaging them, but I was making connections to their own life. I wasn't preaching my knowledge. I wasn't dropping knowledge, wisdom on them. I was really trying to make them think about experiences in their own world. So wow. to see a photo 30 minutes into a keynote with 200 sets of eyes still locked on me uh, is, is really impactful. And that comes right back to the classroom level of trying to keep 23, 13 year olds engaged. It's no different. And that's, it's, it's, it's a great, I think it'd be a great, uh, you know, a great activity to embark in, in routinely. Right. So if I'm in classroom, maybe I need to intentionally notice, you know, stop and notice how many kids are looking at me, how many of them got their, their heads down or they're doodling or, and like you were saying, just, the, just that data can be very powerful because you come back and reflect on it. Right. And we talked, we, you guys talked about it in, in the book, you know, the importance of, stopping and reflecting and, and to ask yourself, ask yourself the question, you know, what went on during my classroom that made it that I had half the kids and weren't even engaged anymore. Right. So, and, yeah. and you brought it to your keynote and I think that's great. It's a, it's a very important uh, piece of data because we're not teaching or we're not giving keynotes for us. You know, it's, it's for, for other people. We want to inspire them. We want to inspire the kids that are sitting. We want them uh, in our classrooms. We want them to be engaged so we need to listen to what they got to say and we need to notice how they're reacting to what we're doing because yeah. we're the ones that need to adjust. Very, very simple example. Uh, if we got 30 seconds here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About 10 years ago, all of our grade threes bombed an EQAO question. For those listening, that's a standardized test yeah. in the province of Ontario. Uh, and it was uh, it, the question was about writing habitat. So it was more of a would have been like a summary, a recount kind of a question. Our kids knew what habitats were. We talked about it in social studies all the time. The question was, describe a habitat of a chipmunk. So when they came back in grade four, as you know, being administrator, you typically look at that data on the first PA day in September. And we're trying to figure out why all our entire class bombed this one question. Mm -hmm. So on the Monday after the PA day, we literally went down and said, what happened? And you know what they said? What they say? What's a chipmunk? <laughs> and it's always something like that. Eh? It's they it's... don't have chipmunks in southern Ontario. Yeah, How is yeah. that a standardized test? That's yeah. intentional. That's intentional bias. Yeah. Data bias. Yeah. No, you're right. And we need to we need to notice those things. We need to take a look at that. Right. So there was a grade nine math question about yeah. TTP. I'm like, come on. For those listening at home, that's a subway system, tra public transit in Toronto. If you don't yeah. live in Toronto and ride it every day, how are you going to do a math question about it? Exactly. Exactly. Man, eye opening, eye opening, Brian, you're awesome. Uh, listen for the people that are, that are here with us listening or watching on YouTube. Um, you know, how can we find you on, on I'm an uh, open book. You, yeah. you can Google me. I'm all over Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you name it. I'm there. Uh, 
All right. So listen, I will link up uh, codebreakeredu.com, mraspinall.com, your Perfect. Twitter handle, everything uh, on the website in the show notes. So uh, for the people listening, you got to head on out to inspireleadership.ca in the podcast section. Brian's going to have a page all to himself. Nice big picture. And the links will be there to get a hold of him. And I'll link up the book as well, uh, Disrupt the Status Quo. So listen, Brian, you are awesome. And if you can get the random airdrop photos going again, I would really appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> but listen, thanks for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. It was a great conversation. And I'm looking forward to interviewing Christine, which will be the last one. And then I'm really looking forward to us uh, finding a time to get together and just cap off this awesome series uh, you know, in regards to the book, Disrupt the you know, Status Quo. Yeah, it's it's been really fun to work with uh, a primary teacher, myself, who's got middle school intermediate. Yeah, yeah. We've got a high school principal and we've got a district leader and now I'm in higher ed. So we yeah. can bring a perspective from the whole the whole universe, I guess, if you will. Absolutely. Thanks again, Brian. Thank Appreciate you. It. All right. Take care.